This session is focusing in on child protection monitoring in emergencies with a specific look at the monitoring and reporting mechanism. And I'm very delighted to have Stéphane Pichette with us. Uh, Steph is a child protection and emergency specialist at UNICEF New York. Um, he's just come back from, uh, he was telling me his first full French training uh, that he provided um, on the MRM. Uh, he's an experienced trainer, very experienced in both the MRM, but also more and more looking at this topic, this, uh, this notion of how are we monitoring child protection overall in emergencies. So I'm delighted to pass the floor over to Steph. Oh, thank you so much, uh, Joanna. And uh, thank you, Ali Ocha, for helping us through this whole exercise. And, and good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, depending on where you are. Uh, Joanna, your, your, even your introduction that you were saying about the, uh, uh, the minimum standards um, that you guys are going to be discussing um, in a little while in Geneva is uh, actually led us <clears throat> to discuss more in depth uh, over the past year or even a little bit more over the past year and a half or so. Um, this issue that, that we're going to uh, discuss today, this issue of child protection monitoring in emergencies, to set the stage maybe is that uh, there, was, there has been a lot of attention in the past more or less five years or so in developing the right rapid assessment tools and also in the past five, five or, five or six years, this issue of the MRM, which is, you know, stemming from the Secretary General and, and the Security Council and so on, which is, uh, which is highly specific on what it looks, uh, it looks at and how it looks at it and so on. But in between, in between the rapid assessment in any kind of an emergency and, and with the MRM in conflict situations, there was, if you want, this, this large gap um, that 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 has been identified, that was experienced in, in in the past in the in the past few large emergencies. So it led the discussions in, in the past while on what does that mean for child protection. It, it's been it's been established then um, that this gap should uh, really be filled with something something that we call child protection monitoring. Um, UNHCR through the protection cluster does general protection monitoring. Any other sector that work you know that that do work into humanitarian sector settings, conflict settings, and so on, do have their own way of monitoring, whether it be nutrition, uh, water, health, and so on. And that's something that was a, a bit lacking uh, within child protection. So all hands were put together in, in, the past, uh, in the past 18 months or so to bring, to, to, to bring together this, this, this child protection monitoring minimum standards, which is, is going to be used uh, for the first time in a little while, as you're saying, Joanna, when it's rolled out. And it's really to bridge these issues between, between um, the rapid assessment and the more specific monitoring, which is one of them is the MRM, uh, the other one is the MARA and GBV and so on, the, the really more specific uh, monitoring systems called for by the uh, Security Council and the Secretary General. So just to set the stage, that's really uh, the thinking behind it. And, uh, and now we're going to move on to what exactly the standard says, um, and I guess you see it now on the screen, it's monitoring child protection concerns systematically uh, triggers prevention and response activities. I think this is quite important because the idea is not to know what's going on, but it's to know what's going on so it systematically uh, brings the, the child protection communities to take action to prevent and respond to, respond to it. Um, and the last part is uh, objective and timely information is collected uh, in a way that is ethical from confidential and safe because we know that child protection, it's a, um, there's, there's, there's some ethical aspect that, uh, that not all sectors have to deal with, but they're very important in our line of work. So the next, the next, the next, the next uh, part is going to be when, when, when do we need to launch this kind of thing, this, this uh, child protection monitoring? And, um, and, and the answer is in any emergency, really. Uh, even before an emergency, it would be even better to have child protection monitoring and just, just bring it up to, up to speed dur during an emergency. 
and uh, once again it's so linked with the with the rapid assessment because the rapid assessment is like a picture of the situation where you pull out what are the main concerns and the ongoing monitoring the child protection monitoring would be like the movie that continues to go on and actually brings in the new issues of concern that may arise uh, so so when definitely uh, at the onset of an emergency and continues thereafter until the situation is normalized and there is no more concerns. What kind of concerns are we talking about? Well, this is, this is if you take any kind of emergencies that have happened in, 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 in the past few years, we're all gone through um, different sets of concerns uh, depending on the emergencies. And it goes all the way from, from, from abductions, abuse, detention, well, killing, maiming, recruitment, and so on, sexual ex exploitation, violence, trafficking, some of which that happen more in conflict, some of which uh, happen um, both in natural emergencies and some conflict, and in conflict, some of which, if it's in conflict, will actually be covered by the, the, the system of the MRM uh, 16 to, uh, from Resolution 1612 that we'll talk about in a little bit, but some of them don't. So again, that's that gap. The issue is as emergencies evolve, um, as a child protection community, uh, is, is to be able to put in place um, um, the right mechanism to, to be able to identify those as they happen and to be able to prevent them and respond, uh, respond to them as fast as possible. Now, why, why doing that, uh, that uh, monitoring? It's a, it's a little bit in line with, with the actual standard itself. It's, it's uh, how, how do you know what the response is and what the prevention mechanisms are if you don't really know what the situation is? Um, so, for example, the situation in Haiti was vastly different from the one in Pakistan, and the child protection concerns were were actually quite different, and again, different from another emergency, which could be a large-scale conflict and so on. And, and in order to know exactly what we need to work on, what programs to develop and so on, a, a, a proper monitoring system to know what's going on is fundamental to be able to put the resources where they need to be. Uh, so, so two more slides, actually one more slide for, for the uh, monitoring, the minimum, the, the minimum standard on, on child protection monitoring itself is, uh, is when, when implementing a child protection monitoring, uh, and this is, this is all, uh, all put in the, in the minimum standards that Joanna is going to probably share with, with all of you if you don't already have it, but a mapping of the, of the situation, uh, what are the assessments that have already been made, how do we put coordination mechanisms in place and the necessary capacity uh, for the people to do the monitoring, how to trigger uh, programmatic response uh, from the, the, the issues of concerns raised by the monitoring, and, and a little bit further, depending on the violations, it can actually be linked with some reparations on human rights issues. And definitely community outreach is the fact that, uh, that those mechanisms can actually be stemming from the existing child protection, uh, community-based child protection mechanisms all the way to um, the protection, the child protection subcluster doing its work on coordination of the information and so on. I think I'm going to stop there and, and we're going to link the next part with the, the MRM a little bit more specifically, but, uh, but uh, let's, let's, let's take a few minutes to actually discuss a little bit this uh, child protection monitoring, which is fairly new and will be uh, rolled out in the months to come. But I can jump in first off, Stefan. Yeah. Uh, so the, these are obviously, this is a draft global standard. It's going to be finalized. There's no training material against it yet, but there's no, um, there's no operational side to it yet either, yes? Is there any guidance note that's going to come out on how to use this standard, given that it's so new compared to maybe our separated children standard or our uh, GBV standard and so on? Okay, do you want me to answer directly or take a few questions and then answer them all? Uh, up to you. Okay, let's do it one by one then. Um, this, is, this is a very good question. There are no guidelines yet um, because as it is so new, it will be experienced in the next while and that's going to be a decision that's going to have to be taken 
um, in, in Geneva in the next, uh, w when discussing the minimum standards, to know how long this needs to be experienced in the field before moving on to uh, more practical guidelines on how to use it and what were the good practices to actually use it in the field. But I would say probably, given that it's, it's, it, it's never really been done systematically, I would say probably a good year of experience in the different emergencies or before, before a guideline is written and, and rolled out. But decision, again, decision will be taken by the group in Geneva. Hi, uh, it, it's Miriam. Uh, thank you, Stefan, for the beginning of this very interesting presentation, an extremely interesting subject. Um, I think the standard is very clear in terms of what it means doing child protection monitoring. Uh, I wonder if in the guidance uh, note or whatever that will be, there will be uh, any information about how do you then uh, put all this information together and I think about the database. And I don't have any experience on working on database on the MRM, for example. And I wonder when you have like UNICEF in the field, you have DPKO and you have said the children and the agencies being part of this MRM and what, what, what beside the confidentiality issue, of course, what, uh, what are the general practices in terms of having the information in one database or in several databases? And what is the role of the government also? Uh, I guess it depends on various countries, but what is the role of the government in, in, in this database as well? These, these are really two very excellent questions. <laughs> Thank you, Miriam. Um, okay, uh, the first question on the database. Uh, uh, yes, I tried, I tried to keep the presentation as minimal as possible, but one of the first issues um, uh, that needs to be addressed in any country with an emergency is to identify the information management system from the get-go at the same time as you start uh, the coordination. Now, the information management system begins with how uh, you use paper um, even at the, uh, you know, at, in, the, uh, in, in the field uh, to be able to collect the information, making sure that everyone agrees to uh, use the same, the same monitoring uh, forms and so on, all the way to how this information from the collection point will actually be agglomerated at, at, the, uh, at, at the national level and, uh, and how it will be put in, in any kind of electronic form or not decided, uh, as decided by the coordination at the moment. Um, I, would, I, would, I would tend to think and believe that it will be systematically put in electronic form, uh, but again, there's no, there's no guidelines on that. It will certainly come with the good practice. The second question on, uh, on what's the role of the government, unlike the MARA or the MRM, I would think that with practice we're going we're, we're, we're gonna to learn a little bit more, but this is something that, that as a matter of fact, it should be part of uh, what the, the uh, subcluster does or the child protection community does in and along with the government. And again, this is something that will be experienced in the coming year and years and so on. So two very good okay. questions uh, that, will need, that will need to be answered with, with practice. Thanks. Hi, this is Hani. Hi, Stefan. Hi, Hani. Uh, thanks a lot. This is this is great presentation. I'm looking forward to the rest of it. Uh, just just wanted to reiterate. I'm uh, I'm very glad that you started your presentation with talking about the connection between the initial phase, which is the, the rapid assessments that you do, and then longer term um, um, activities and monitoring that that we do. Uh, just just to give you a a sense of what I get from the field every single time that I do training or support a country office in doing a rapid assessment. One of the first questions that, that I receive is, can we use this as a monitoring tool in the long run to, to basically keep going back to the communities and, and collect data? And uh, to, the, to the point that it's actually one of the first slides in the, tra in the training that it says this is not a monitoring tool. Um, so it's, it seems to be a serious need on the ground to have a system that can link uh, rapid assessment and the information that we get in, in the initial phase to, to longer term intervention. Um, so I think it's, uh, we could potentially, I mean, I look forward to the discussions in Geneva, but, but basing it on the rapid, rapid assessments and, and the tools that exist, including the database and all that, build 
built on on top of it and and go into more operational phase of uh, of what you're suggesting. Oh yeah, honey, thank thank you so much for that. I couldn't agree more with you. Um, if we take if we take if 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 you want if we take the uh, the experience of uh, let's pick another sector. Let's pick nutrition. Um, on the onset of an emergencies or, or even in a protracted emergencies, when is time to, uh, to know what the situation is in a, in, in a specific location? Um, there's two tools that are being used, and, and the first one is, uh, is a survey, a nutritional survey, to know what the, what's, what's the picture of the situation at that very moment. And the second one is what they call surveillance, nutritional surveillance. Those are the two tools that one gives you an immediate picture and the other one is set and, and, and keeps on monitoring over time uh, as long as needed and as long as necessary. This is a little bit of the idea. And, and, and honey, as you were saying, uh, as a matter of fact, now, um, thankfully now we get, we get a really good tool, the rapid assessment and so on, but it's similar if you wanted a nutritional survey that they have in nutrition. And, and then um, the, the monitoring, the child protection monitoring system that hopefully will actually be extremely compatible with the, with the uh, rapid assessment tool and, and, and be a, a natural follow-up to the rapid assessment. Um, but that's, that's something that will need to be, to be addressed as this tool is being developed over the coming year and so on. Um, yes, it's difficult to take a rapid assessment tool to turn it into a monitoring tool, but it's, I think it's very possible to make sure that they speak to each other very well in the long run. So thank you for that, honey. Thank you. Stefanis, Joanna, if I could just jump in with a trainer's question. Sure. Uh, the, the standards aren't quite finalized, and they're not yet rolled out. Uh, this will be a new one, as I said, compared to many of the other areas in which we've worked. Uh, yeah. There's no guidance note yet. So as we're doing, um, you know, people who are online are, and watching this are trainers. They're training at the introductory level or, or maybe at the intermediate level. In this interim period, what would be the one or two messages you would want them to get across to participants in such workshops? Hmm. Okay. No, that's, uh, again, Joanna, very good question, um, uh, because it's a tough one. It's a tough one in the interim period, uh, between the time that um, the, I, I, a new idea comes along and is embraced by, the, uh, by, by all the different partners and so on, and, and until the time you actually has have clear guidelines that are field tested. But one thing, one thing is for sure, let, 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 let me bring two ideas to it. Um, one is that even though there's not, there, there hasn't been an actual standard on it, no matter what, we have had to, to do monitoring in the previous emergencies is one, in one way or another. It was just not so systematic. Now, in the interim time, now we're, we're, what, we're, what we're proposing with the new standard is that you don't, it's not that you, you, you think about it if you're going to do it or not. It's, it's you need to establish it just like you need to do the rapid assessment. You need to put in place this monitoring standards, standard. So the first two, the, the two things that it seems that come out as the most important is, um, is, as Miriam was saying, having a clear information management system from the start, and the second one is having clear leadership for the coordination on how they want to go, how the coordination wants to go forward with the collection of this information, the passation of this information, to be able to trigger and that's the third thing, to be able to systematically, uh, systematically trigger prevention and response. So three things, I would say. Get the, make sure that you get the, the, the one, way, one information management system. Again, information management system is both the paper collection form and eventually the electronic media, if, if it's uh, decided to go with the electronic media. Um, so that's one thing to make sure that everyone is speaking the same language with that. Uh, second thing, making sure it's part of the uh, every coordination activities that are happening. Well, when the subcluster meets, they should also talk about what what has what is the outcome of the monitoring or even the establishment of the monitoring at the beginning. But the other thing as well is that there's the, it's it's it, there's no use collecting information if you're not going to act on it. So the prevention and the response is the third. Uh, I 
I guess, the third crucial element that even without any kind of guidelines that should be taken forward uh, to make sure that, that the, this exercise of collecting the information on concerns actually leads to practicality and the better protection of the children. All right. I, 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 I assume um, that, uh, that the people are a little bit more um, familiar with the issue of the, of the MRM uh, because it's been along for quite a while. It's been along ever since 2005, so it's working on seven years now of the existence of this mechanism or of the, existing, the existence of the two documents that were important in actually creating this initiative. So uh, back in 2005, it was the Secretary General's report that established in a plan on how, what an MRM would look like, and then Resolution 1612 said, use that plan and implement it. Uh, now, it is, uh, in, in all way, shape, or form, it, 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 it was a, a, a humongous leap uh, for, for child protection because it was the first time that the, the thematic issue was actually um, adopted uh, on human rights, uh, on, on human rights issues at the Security Council and just so happens to be on children in armed conflict. Um, so, in a way, anyone working on child protection and, and ch on, on, on the issue of child, children in um, conflict feel quite privileged that the Secretary General and, and, the, um, and the Security Council have decided to, to take that on board as a peace and security issue. Um, so, M MRM, for, for, the, for those who are not totally familiar, it's the monitoring reporting mechanism on grave violations against children in situations of armed conflict. Uh, we are going to talk about what the six grave violations are in a moment, uh, but just uh, uh, as written into the, uh, the resolution uh, 1612, it's based on, on international humanitarian law, human rights law, criminal law and jurisprudence in, in the security resolutions themselves uh, that ever since uh, that one that created the mechanism, the 1612 and 2005, there's been two other ones and probably more to come in the coming years. Uh, so there's, there's, a solid, there's a solid body of, uh, of, uh, of laws supporting uh, the work that is being done with the uh, uh, MRM. Uh, now, I said the uh, 1612 in 2005 was the creating, uh, was, was the, the resolution that actually created the, the entire MRM or the monitoring, uh, reporting mechanism throughout, uh, throughout the world in conflict situations. But there was also 1882 in 2009 and 1998 in 2011. Uh, so two other resolutions that we'll see what they brought uh, more specifically uh, in 2009 and 2007. Um, what do we need by grave violations? This is, this is, uh, this is interesting in history. So in 2004, there was, there was a, a number of consultations that were done to say, to establish and identify which are the grave violations. I mean, there's so many that could have been uh, identified as the, as the gravest violations, but it, 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 was, it, it was identified, six of them were identified uh, by the child protection community, backed up by the Secretary General, and adopted by the Security Council as the, um, uh, the violations that really need to be followed. Uh, by, by this exercise of the MRM. Who are we monitoring? Who are we monitoring through this exercise? Um, it's a, in a country uh, where there is one party that has been identified as a violator of one of the six uh, violations, but more specifically, one of the four violations now that are considered as a trigger to the MRM. Uh, in that country, in a situation where there's a conflict area, all parties uh, in, in that area are being monitored. And what's the objective of the monitoring of grave violations? It's so, this is, this is so the same or there are similar objective as the child protection monitoring itself is really knowing what's the situation of the grave violations and what to do to prevent and stop those violations. Um, now the next, the, next, the next one, the next slide that you will see, it's a bit of a visual, so that's easier for those that have access 
to the uh, uh, to the to the PowerPoint to their computer. It, it's basically it, it's a, it's a timeline from 1996 to 2011 on the different um, uh, Security Council resolution uh, that uh, that were adopted over over this period of time. Uh, so these. Uh, this shows the importance that the Security Council has, has put over time on this issue of children in armed conflict. Now, so it goes all the way from the Grasso Michel study that then triggered the resolution 1261 and all the different resolutions until last year in 2011, security, the resolution 1998. So the next slide, it's, it's other other benchmarks. So um, the, the the previous slide was really the the political aspect of it, and really the Security Council, which is resolution and 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 the kickstart the Secretary General in 1996 with the Michel study. Uh, but this slide is, um, is 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 different. Other. Um, milestones on the issue of uh, the children in armed conflict agenda, all the way from the the first appointment of the SRG on children and armed conflict, uh, Olara Tonu, in 1997, just following the Michelle report, uh, to the Michelle ten-year report in 2008, and everything in in between, including the Cape Town principles, the Paris principles, the Rome Statute, and so on. So again, a lot of international instruments and, and, and international developments, such as the Office of the SRSG CAC, on this issue, have evolved over time. So um, the next, the next, the next slide is. Uh, um, is what we were opening with in the history of the Security Council, the first human rights issue that led to the creation of a special Security Council working group is the issue of children in armed conflict, and that's, you see the resolution 1612 there. Um, the six grave violations, um, and, and, and to be fair, this should go a little bit higher when we started talking about it a few slides back, it's the, the killing and maiming of children the recruitment and use of children by armed forces or armed groups, uh, sexual violence, attacks on schools and hospitals, abductions, and denial of access to humanitarian assistance. Um, so those are the ones that have been identified back in 2004 that have been adopted by the Secretary General in his report in, in 2005, and that actually led finally to the Security Council Resolution 1612 saying we use those violations as the six violations to deal with at the moment. Um, so the, the next one, Aliocha, I see that we haven't seen the, yeah, the, the, the six violations. I think most people are actually familiar with, with those, so that's good. The next one is today, in, in, in 2012, there's, um, there are uh, 15 countries that are officially uh, undertaking and implementing the MRM. Um, you see two countries on the slide there. You see two countries in, um, in more of a light green color, Cote d'Ivoire and Burundi. Those are countries where parties to the conflict were violators and ceased to be violators over time and have complied uh, with the um, uh, with the having an action plan to commit to stop the violations and letting the situation being monitored by the country task forces. Now, there's one more. There should be OPT. If uh, Aliocha, if you click one more OPT, the, the reason why it's there, it's because it's not an MRM country. It has not been, but OPT is extremely active on on actually doing a parallel system to the MRM, and it's, it's CAC monitoring. And, uh, and they have OPT as one of the, the um, uh, most mature human rights monitoring uh, mechanism in the world that has been doing work for about 60 years. Uh, so they continue doing it, and they continue to monitor the grave violations, and a little bit more, they also do close monitoring on the illegal detention of children and so on. So OPT, while not an MRM country, has a lot of experience and a lot to share. So the back back to 2005, this, the, the the resolution 1612 brought um, a few things that were important and quite innovative 
um, it's, it's the, f- the first thing is that this 1612 actually asked the Security Council to create the Security Council Working Group on Children in Armed Conflict. So this has been meeting since 2005 to follow up on the issue and the situation on children in armed conflict. The second one is uh, the MRM established in countries uh, where there was a list. Um, uh, where there was parties that were listed as violators. Back in 2005, um, the trigger mechanism was only on recruitment and use of children. Now, the task force, uh, and, and the third thing is that not only the MRM needs to be established, but then there has to be a task force in the countries that have been identified and listed. And these task forces need to be at the highest level of of the the UN architecture in the country related to children. So that means the 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 UNICEF representative is always co-chair in any country. And depending if you have a mission or not, the the other co-chair is the the resident coordinator in a country without a mission or the SRSG. Um, in a country with a mission. So that's very, very high level. Again, the working group, the, the, the Security Council creating a working group is a big milestone and then asking the highest entities of the United Nations related to children in a country to actually co-chair the task force is also very powerful. One thing that is very important is that the MRM is not to conduct uh, criminal prosecutions or contribute to national and international criminal processes. It, incre- it, 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 it creates public documents through the Secretary General's report that anyone can actually use for their own for their own use, for their own investigation that may eventually lead to prosecution. But the idea of the MRM is not a criminal exercise. Uh, now, the next one, uh, as we said, after 1612 and 2005, there was two other resolutions that have, have been adopted since. So, 1882 and 2009, and 1998 and 2011. Uh, again, some milestones in each of those resolutions. Uh, 1882, 1882 and 2009 um, and led to an expansion of the trigger for the listing exercise that was only recruitment and use uh, since 2005. In 2009, it expanded to the killing and maiming and sexual uh, violence, killing and maiming of children and sexual violence against children. Uh, so again, uh, a fairly important milestone. Um, and then uh, action plans had been something that was quite important um, uh, since since the beginning of the exercise on children in armed conflict, even before 1612. But in the last resolution, it takes more and more shape in the way that the resolutions themselves are asking, really, to the parties, the offending parties, to engage with the UN, United Nations uh, task force or the task force on the, on the MRM in the country to make sure to develop an action plan to commit to envi- violations and to let the task force monitor the compliance of this of this action plan, which is a very, in and itself, it's a very, very powerful tool if used correctly. And the new thing with, 19, uh, with uh, 1882 then was the enhanced communication between um, the uh, Security Council Sanctions Committee on persistent uh, violators. So basically the line which the sanctions committee is a political exercise and and basically the Secretary General and the Security Council have, have agreed that this exercise should and could be linked with the sanctions committee for the persistent violators. And of course this is something that has always since the beginning was looming is is the uh, it's not just about monitoring and reporting but the but automatic trigger to the appropriate responses which again is the same the same thinking uh, process as the child protection monitoring. You don't monitor to monitor. You monitor to actually prevent and to put an end to the, to the violations in response to uh, the, the victims of the violations. So the next one, uh, 1998, which is just last year, um, is the, again extension of the triggers to attacks on schools and hospitals, which 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 is uh, actually leads and and forces in a way better collaboration and closer collaboration beyond beyond child protection and beyond 
protection to actually uh, collaborate with other other sectors, the, the sectors of education and the sectors of health, in order to be able to have the proper uh, monitoring in place and verification system in place to be able to, to monitor those issues of tax on schools and, and hospitals. So again, that brings closer the child protection issues to other sectors, which is a very positive aspect of integrated protection of, of children. Um, and then allow the Security Council to consider a uh, range of options for increasing pressure on pers persistent per perpetrators. So the, the issue of persistent per perpetrators, again, in, it came out in 1882 to say there should be closer links with the Sanctions Committee. Now, now it, it requests the Security Council to actually think and look at other options to put pressure on the persistent per perpetrators. Um, once again, not a criminal ex exercise, but pressure is a political exercise, as the Security Council can do and the Secretary General can help doing. Uh, what parties are monitored? This is this is back a little bit to uh, uh, what we were discussing at the very beginning. Who to monitor? Is once a country has been as has been well, once a party in a country has been identified, this country needs to establish a task force. Whether there's one party that is a violator or 27, like in Sudan, that are violating the, the, the that that are perpetrating grave violations against children, a mechanism is being established, and and in the conflict areas, all parties are monitored. So the non-violator today can be the violator of tomorrow. So the the, the monitoring system goes through all the parties. Um, and uh, and the se second part of it, if the MRM has been triggered in the country uh, because of one party, as we were saying, it doesn't mean that we only monitor that party. We monitor all parties that are uh, that are uh, part of the conflict. Um, and what is your role? That's probably what you're what, what you're what you're asking right now. What what is everyone's role in all of that? Um, how if you if you come across a grave violation, which we we all have, what do you do? How would you report that? And that's something that needs to be clear within the country and established by the task force. If there is an MRM, this is something that needs to be established by the coordinate child protection coordination or the subcluster in a country. If there's no MRM and it's just a general monitoring child protection monitoring mechanism that is in place, and this is this should be clear for everyone what to do in such a case. Um, what the, what would you tell the victims, the survivor, the family, and the witnesses, and so on? These are so delicate issues that indeed uh, part of what we were talking about in the child protection monitoring is at least a minimum um, a minimum training on how to monitor and how to engage with uh, with the victims and the witnesses. That is an, um, a crucial point to make sure that there's no further re-traumatization of any kind of uh, of children or even the family uh, on those on those types of violations. And what's your role in providing a response? I wish it was interactive, but since it's not interactive, the 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 um, the role in providing. Uh, well, let, 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 let's leave that one open because we're now. This is the last slide, so that would be nice in the um, in the interaction now to see what do you think is your role in providing a response and and why is it important? And Joanna and uh, Aliocha, over to you. <laughs> Great. Well, we can kick off with that question as well as uh, any other questions uh, that people who've dialed in have. Yes, I would like it's Miriam again. Uh, just yes, to come to this question that you asked at the end about what is your role in providing a response, and 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 my question would be like, how can you do? And that and that's a very difficult question and a very ethical, I believe, questions. And how can you do like? I would say, like, effective and safe monitoring of grave violations against children in in a, in a country where there is a conflict and where the main perpetrator is the government itself. And you have the duty to provide assistance to the victims and to try to prevent harm against them, but you also have a duty to report about what is happening. And the fact that you are reporting on what is happening might sometimes, you know, put your personal at risk and also um, um, force you to leave at some point the country or you you might have the risk to be expelled from the country. So how how do you 
I mean, how can you then do proper monitoring and safe monitoring, taking into account these, these difficulties of providing the need to provide an assistance and at the same time the need to report? Um, once again. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a difficult one, I know. <laughs> you touch a very sensitive point, but a very, very important. Um, okay. One thing um, that I think I omitted uh, to within the country task, the government are not part of the task force. That's something that is important for the, for the reason that you identified. The, the government can be a perpetrator and is a perpetrator in many countries, and the, um, the violations need to be monitored. So that's the first step. Um, the MRM is different from any other child protection monitoring mechanisms. Uh, because the government is not is not part of the monitoring exercise of the MRM itself, requested by the Security Council and the Secretary General. Um, so that's the first point to, to to set clear. Now, within the good practices and the guidelines related to the MRM, it's important for the country task forces to meet on a regular basis with the government at two levels. At the principal level, which means the co-chairs, the heads of agency, the UN, the UN heads, the, the, the representative of UNICEF and the secretary general or the resident coordinator, to meet on a regular basis every two or three months with their government counterparts at the uh, ministerial or director level. <clears throat> And to actually discuss the issue, discuss and discuss the different violations, discuss the way to respond to the violations, because part of your question as well, part of the answer to your question is that the government is the primary responsible to prevent the violations and to prevent uh, to to respond to 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 the actual violations. Now, this so that means that the that puts the the the, the country task force in a situation where they're monitoring. Um, um, non-state actors monitoring the, gov the government as well and identifying violations that the government is doing through its own forces or through um, and, and, uh, through proxy forces like like uh, uh, community um, uh, uh, self-defense forces and so on that are supported by the government. This happens. This has been happening since 2005. The uh, there has been no one. A PNG uh, for that. Uh, uh, luckily enough, since 2005, in a number uh, in 17 countries that have ex experienced conflict, and we have identified as as a very good practice that it even becomes easier to address those issues with the government if the senior management meets on a regular basis with the government and at uh, both at the principal level and at the technical level to discuss a way to move forward more strategically to stop the violation. So the government, the governments don't want to be seen as perpetrators. They are in some cases, but they want to work into not being perpetrators anymore. So in a way, it, it, the best practice is to be able to turn it into something positive and to work with the government in question to say we're going to work together on this, not only just to, to monitor, but to, to try to put an end to it, to try to prevent it and to try to stop it. And then, and then the government itself gets political re recognition for the efforts that they're doing. So if you have the right approach and the government has the right approach, it has been possible and it is possible to address the issue of the violations, to address the issue of the prevention and the response and to move forward. Um, and uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the violations related to government have been uh, monitored and reported ever since, ever since 2005. So there's quite a bit of experience in it. Maybe let me add one more thing just on that. We're, we're finalizing now um, um, the first ever global good practices on the MRM that will come out in a few months uh, so that will help understand what countries have done in those kinds of situations, difficult situations, to actually move forward the issue of the child protection um, the, the MRM uh, while maintaining good relationships with the government. Very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. If I could jump in there, Stefan, it's Joanna again. Yeah. Uh, one of the things, <coughs> excuse me, one of the things that I note when I 
do an introductory training. Obviously, we don't do the, I don't do the in-depth MRM training. So it's people who might be aware that this is needed or maybe this is happening in parallel to the work that they do. But they're very skeptical and very concerned about safety, skeptical about its impact and so on. So I don't know if the, the, the guidance notes that you're just about to release, uh, to release of best practices has kind of really pithy case studies that show impact of this mechanism and show how the safety has really been taken into account. Because these would be great to share with those who are skeptical in this kind of introductory level that I, that I often train in. Sure, sure, sure. This is a really good point. Um, the, um, just, uh, just to go back a little bit in time, just uh, in 2010, um, and the um, MRM guidelines and field manual uh, were published and, 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 and shared, uh, and they will come online very soon, actually, in, in one month or two. They will be actually available online and so on. And these, this one document is, 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 is the mini Bible on the issue of how to address anything related to the MRM. So that's, 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 which addresses the issue of, of security and, and safety and confidentiality. So that's one thing. The second thing is that, uh, it, it will be complemented again with the good practices that are coming. And yes, it addresses the issues of safety and confidentiality and how, how con some of the countries have been able to overcome that. Because at the end of the day, I mean, this, is, this was when it came out in 2005, there was, there was a lot of partners um, that uh, were to implement this mechanism or that were working on child rights or child protection that were not sure which way it was going to go because it was perceived in one way as a pure human rights mechanism, which it, it, it was not. It, it, uh, it's also a, a general, the, the approach, uh, it's, it's, it's not just child rights, it's not just human rights, it's also working with the communities to help them themselves um, empower uh, themselves to say, uh, to be able to know what to do to prevent uh, those, those issues. Um, so over, over time, over the years, um, more and more partners have seen what was going on and have decided to become um, integral part of the, uh, the activities of the MRM, whether or not they participate in a task force or not. Um, I do remember the first meeting we had in 2005 in DRC at the, uh, at the time when the resolution came with the different partners in Kinshasa, and it was a very limited amount of partners that wanted to take that on. Today, it's the different story. Most of the partners that were not wanting to be part of it back then want to be part of it now. Uh, so it has evolved quite a bit uh, through time. And one of the reasons is because one way or another, the teams on the ground in the field have been able to actually engage with the parties to the conflict, including the government, uh, to avoid safety and security concerns, and which means that the advancement of the child protection um, the, the, inc the increase of, the ch uh, the, of, uh, of child protection through the MRM has been now experienced and documented in a way that people feel more comfortable today than they did in 2005. Thank you, Stefan. Before we wrap up, is there any final question or comment someone would like to throw in? Maybe another question. Uh, in some countries like Cote d'Ivoire, where which have been delisted from from the list of the Secretary General, uh, and and in general in the world, uh, do you have experience that MRM is continuing after the conflict is over because it became somehow a good practice and people realize it's very useful to continue monitoring the protection needs of children in this country? What what's what's happening in those countries where the conflict is over? Yes. Um, again. Again question on this because uh, yeah Cote d'Ivoire was the first country to be to be delisted so that that was not requested anymore to do an official um, MRM uh, within the country what happened in Cote d'Ivoire is after the delisting um, there was for one reason or another um, there was for a little while um, the country team that actually diminished um, quite a bit the, the, the monitoring and then there's um, there's the um, uh, the 
the political unrest that started again, which led to a full-blown conflict again. And, and then the monitoring restarted again, and the country, the, the team realized that it should have never stopped because some of the mechanisms were not in place anymore. So these mechanisms have been reactivated in Cote d'Ivoire. They're, they're still going on today, even though there's no official MRM there. And, and the, the lessons learned from that, as, as you were saying, is that it's good to continue some kind of monitoring mechanism, whether it's the MRM or anything else like child protection monitoring. It's quite important to actually continue that in one way or another by the child protection community after a delisting happens. And, and for many reasons, just for the sheer protection of the children, um, uh, but also to make sure that it, should there be a, a reactivation of a conflict, the system's in place to actually reactivate very quickly to prevent the violations against children and, and, and to ensure proper communication with the parties to the conflict. Thank you. Lovely. Any final question or comment? Doesn't seem so. <laughs> so let us move to the wrap up. First off, to thank Stefan very much for uh, preparing this right off uh, a training that he's done and before he heads off again, I think tonight or tomorrow, to squeeze us in. It's been very appreciated. Thank you, Stefan, for your expertise and, uh, and for taking the time to do this with us. And, and, uh, and thank you so much, Joanna and Aliocha and, and everyone that uh, participated. Uh, your questions. <laughs> We're really good, and actually lead us to to uh, to make sure that we, we keep the uh, the good practices and, and and the guidelines as clear as possible on the way forward in this quite delicate issue. So thanks again, Joanna.